Hello and welcome to an episode of Buy This, Not That, Mead Edition. I go through Mead's long history and pick models that I think are worth buying as well as the ones I think you should probably avoid. Now Mead, with its vast catalog starting back in 1972, has grown to be one of the giants of our hobby, and it was, or at one point was, the largest telescope manufacturer in the entire world. With such a vast product offering over such a long time, it's inevitable that some models are more desirable than others. So let's get started. So the first Mead telescope to buy is Mead 6-inch and 8-inch schmidt cassegrains This is an easy conservative recommendation, and in fact, the 8-inch schmidt cassegrain to some people is Mead. The 6-inchers in particular are very easy to recommend. It's a relatively new design. It's only been around for around 10 years or so, and even the oldest models have yet to age out. The 8-inch models also very good. Mead's styling has changed very little in the past 40 years, so you want to watch out to see if you're getting a really old one. Even if you are getting an old one, it's okay. Optically, these things are usually pretty good, provided the telescope has not been mistreated. One of the major problems is oxidation and other kinds of corrosion on the mirror, but this is usually pretty easy to check. If you're buying something remotely, ask the seller to take a picture of the mirror, and it's usually pretty easy to spot if there's a problem. I did have one issue with an 8-inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain that I bought. It had the corrosion not on the mirror but on the corrector plate itself. And here's a picture of what it looks like. The seller was pretty generous about this and offered me a substantial discount. He's pretty honest. I bought it, I think, probably because I was sorry for it more than anything else. And I figured, uh, well, maybe it's not that bad. I'd kind of convince myself that the telescope would be okay, which it wasn't. I wound up passing this one on to another club member, and he's trying to see if he can fix it. Mechanically, a little bit more of a concern as some of the older models are starting to age out, particularly the early LX200 models, some of which are starting to develop problems, and me doesn't support this anymore, so if you're trying to fix it, you're on your own trying to find used parts, and you could run into an issue. I have one of these. It's the one over my shoulder here that's sort of peeking up uh, off the ground there, but when I got it, it was dead. The electronics were not working, and in fact, in my mind, I was already taking the tube off of the fork mount and putting a Bixen compatible rail underneath and sticking it on an equatorial mount. I have a local scope wizard around here who said, let me have a crack at that, and I handed it over to him, and, you know, to be honest, I didn't expect that I would ever see that thing working again, but a few months later, this is his workshop, he called me back and he said, I fixed it. He found some used parts somewhere and was able to repurpose things, and it works. So uh, this, that actually turned out okay for me. So just beware that while it did work out in my case, if you don't have a local scope wizard where you are, you may not be so fortunate. One other thing to watch out for, some of the early LX200s operated off of an 18-volt DC system instead of the 12-volt system that everybody else uses. They only did this for a few years, and in fact, this is one of them. To get this thing working, you do need a sort of converter dongle thing that converts 12 volts into 18 volts. That part often goes missing or fails, so be careful if you do get one of the early models. Also, the jacks for the 12 and the 18 volt power supplies are different, and you can't actually plug one into the other, but who knows, if you get somebody who's really ambitious, they may try to force something on you. Okay, so what about the larger Mead Schmidt Cassegrains? The 10s, the 12s, the 16s, and so forth? Well, overall, yeah, I think they're pretty good. Uh, the 10 inch, there is at least some anecdotal evidence that suggests that people think those were the best ones of all. I don't know if I have enough evidence to substantiate that, but I can tell you that I have a Mead 10 inch Schmidt Cassegrain, and it is one of the very best telescopes that I own right now. The 12s, also very good. This is the largest model you typically find somebody transporting around. One thing I might want to caution you on is some people feel that the LX90 versions are not strong enough to hold such a strong, a big optical tube. They had one at a ground-based observatory when I was at Dartmouth, and I played with that one a lot. This one's on a Paramount, and it's a good way to unwind after class. I had a lot of fun with that one. As for the 16-inchers, you know, there's more of those out there than I expected. I keep running across them. 
These are mainly in permanent installations like observatories. There's this one at the Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire that I sometimes visit and use. And as I travel the country and correspond with you, many of you apparently do have these in home observatories. Back when I was down in Chile in 2017 and 2018, astrotourism is a really big thing down there. And the place where we went had three 12 inch LX 200s and three 16 inch LX 200s. Oh my goodness. I was so overwhelmed with the skies down there that I forgot to take a picture of all of those. I probably should have done that. By the way, if you do get down there, astrotourism is a big thing in that area in Chile, around Santiago especially. There are many of these outfits in this place. We went, take a look at this. This is the lobby. It looks almost, it's nicer than my house. I almost didn't want to go outside. So overall, provided the telescope has not been mistreated in some way, I think a used six inch or eight inch schmidt cassegrain is your best overall buy in a used Mead telescope. So first on the list of Mead telescopes not to buy is Mead four inch schmidt cassegrain these had models like 2040, 2044, 2045D. I don't understand what went wrong here. It is easier to make a four inch mirror than it is to make a larger one, but these things do not have a good reputation for optics. I've owned a couple of these. The last one I had was pretty bad. Uh, especially undesirable are the early ones that have with the 965 inch eyepieces. If you must, Get the latest version possible, the 2045D. The D stands for DC. Yes, the early ones you did have to plug in. Now, it's not the telescope's fault, but it happened to exist in the hyperinflationary 1980s, and the prices of the fours were starting to approach the prices of the eights by the end. Uh, by the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was not unusual to see those four inch Schmidt Cassegrain selling for well over $1,000. And keep in mind, those are 1990s dollars. Mead wasn't the only person who had a problem with this. Celestron had a similar issue with the C5s approaching the cost of the C8s. For whatever reason, the C5s have survived. These four inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrains did not. And of course, in the late 1990s, they came out with the ETX, and of course, that was the end of that. Again, if you do buy one of these used just out of curiosity or nostalgia or whatever, don't pay too much. I have seen these advertised for under $200 and even well under that price point, and some of them even come well appointed. So another one of Mead's telescopes to buy for vintage telescope shoppers, these are the Newtonians, 1977 through about 1983. I've said this before, I think Mead Newtonians from this time period are some of the most beautiful telescopes ever made. Most desirable of all are the research grade models, the eight inch, the 10 inch, and the 12 and a half inch. This ad became a big part of my childhood. Mead, of course, has always been very good at marketing. Another telescope in this range, even though it's not a Newtonian, is the Mead 400 series, four inch F15 refractor. These were brand labeled Unitrons, and they came appointed with various accessories. These, I've seen these things sell for a lot of money, and I've even had people ask me if the Mead is worth more than the Unitron, and some people feel that they are because they only brand labeled them for a couple of years. Clean, used condition models I've seen selling for many thousands of dollars. Here I am posing with one of them at a friend's house. So another one of Mead's telescopes not to buy is Mead Newtonians made after about 1983. I don't know what happened here. I have a friend who says in a span of a year or two, they went from first to worst. So the previous Newtonians were just wonderful telescopes, but then they introduced the Starfinder series. They were really cheaply made, sonotube, plastic focusers, weights on the back to try to make the balance come out, and general, not very good construction. I was slow on the uptake to this. I liked Mead Newtonian so much from the previous generation. I wound up buying the six inch, the eight inch, and the 10 inch before waking up one morning and thinking, why am I doing this? These things are awful. So the equatorial versions may be slightly more desirable because of the pedestal mount. Uh, I'm really concerned about the mounting rings. It's not a ring, it's a strap. And if you loosen the strap, it can sort of spring back at you. I was always concerned somebody was going to get hurt. Now they did make the 16 inch model. 
some people feel that the equatorial model is worth collecting. It was a $2,500. It's not very practical, but it makes a great conversation piece if you have one in your home. The 16-inch mirrors in those older Starfinder Dobsonians and equatorial mounts were considered very good and have formed the basis of projects. You can just take the mirror out and discard the rest of the structure. So another Mead telescope not to buy is Mead ED series refractor mid 1990s to mid 2000s. 4 inch, 5 inch, 6 inch, and 7 inch ED apochromatic refractors on LXD 650 and LXD 750 mounts. Those of you with long memories may recall I did a series of articles about the flagship model, that's 7 inch. It went back to Mead several times, it was never right. That series of articles became very briefly the thing for which I was most well known. So if you're going to buy one of these things, they do come off, up for sale every once in a while. I think overall, with the 20 years of experience I've had dealing with these and talking to you uh, who, own, who own these things, I think the smaller ones are probably slightly more desirable. I don't think that the lens cells were quite strong enough to hold the lenses in the 6-inch and the 7-inch models, which resulted in some of the collimation issues that I found. I don't think the focusers were very good. The mount, yeah, okay for their time. I think the new stuff is better. Even if you find one with, with a mount that's working, keep in mind some of these older ones are coming on 25 years old now, and they don't sell spare parts for those anymore. Also, the shorter focal lengths of the smaller models gives the mount a better chance to acquire its target. Now, a Mead telescope to buy is Mead 7-inch Maxitov Cassegrain. This thing went in and out of the Mead catalog for several years in the 2000s, and it was a, here's a case where Mead tried to branch into a market and it worked. With the ED refractors, maybe not so much. They were clearly going after the Questar 7 here, and these telescopes were expensive, but try pricing a 7-inch Questar. Maxitovs, when properly executed, are very sharp telescopes, and these are no exception. These telescopes were really good in LX50 and LX200 configurations, and they have also been deforked by people who just didn't want to deal with old mounts, and they placed them on equatorial mounts of their own. The telescope does come with one fatal flaw, and those of you who own one of these things know exactly what I'm about to say. It is said that to have some certain parts commonalities with the other telescopes in its line, most notably the 8-inch LX200s, they put a metal weight in the back of there, and the weight not only makes the thing heavier, but it hoards heat, which is the last thing you want in a Maxitov. So if you're ambitious, you can get that piece of metal out of there. There's an excellent thread on cloudy nights, complete with pictures about how to do that. I'll warn you, it's not a beginner's operation. After seeing this, I'm not sure I would be completely comfortable attempting this, but perhaps you know somebody in your area who can do this. If it's a 7-inch Maxitov that you want, there are modern Chinese versions of these sold at least under the Orion and Skywatcher variants. I had one of the Orion units here in for review, and I liked it a lot. Keep in mind, Maxitovs have very long focal lengths and long f-ratios, which rule out a lot of deep-sky astrophotography. However, lunar and planetary photography can be done with the planetary imager, and in fact, the master lunar imager, Robert Reeves, sometimes uses one of these. Usually, the tubes cost around $1,000. Yeah, it's getting up there in terms of the money, but try pricing a 7-inch Questar. So another one of Mead's telescopes not to buy is any entry-level Mead telescope that has 0.965 inch eyepieces in it. There are many of them. It seems with the decline or demise of Tasco, that's the brand we all love to hate, Mead seems to have moved down market to try to fill that void. And so there is some confusion out there because Mead is expected to be a high quality product, but you're starting to see them in department stores and at the lower levels of the internet. One way to determine if any telescope is junk is to measure the eyepiece diameter or find out what it is. If it measures less than an inch, it's probably the 965 inch diameter eyepieces. Those are junk and you want to avoid all of those. And I'll finish with a couple of sleepers. Mead number 4500 4.5 inch f8 reflector on an equatorial mount, and the Mead number 390 and number 395 90 millimeter f11 achromatic refractors also on mounts 
the number 390 is on an alt as mount, the number 395 is on an equatorial mount. These were in the catalog for a very long time, and there's a lot of them out there. And the reason I'm including them on the list is because you can usually find them used at really attractive prices. Don't pay too much if you can get one in good condition with all the original parts. These are really good telescopes to learn on, and perhaps maybe a little bit more. Okay, so there's my list of telescopes that I think you should buy, as well as ones I think you should avoid in Mead's lineup. Do you have a favorite Mead telescope? Do you have an unfavored? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.